analysis, uh, please make sure that if you have the class label information, right, uh, do not include that class label information into the analysis, okay? Because uh, uh, that itself uh, will give you the structure, okay? But that structure is artificial because uh, in practice, you, you make measurements, right? You don't actually get the label. So, so you got to be careful, right? <clears throat> okay, somebody... Okay, it should be okay. Everyone is here. Okay, so <clears throat> so this is the uh, first line, and th basically this will give you um, this copy and paste it here, right? And then uh, basically this will you, you need to turn on the correlation equals to true so that the eigen decomposition is done on the uh, correlation matrix, right? Rather than the covariance matrix. Uh, you will use the cor correlation matrix here because uh, we, we notice that the scale, right, of the variables, uh, they are very different, okay? Uh, so so if you use the covariance, you didn't turn on the correlation equals to true, uh, then you will have artifacts in your principal component analysis, okay? So so we can do this, and then after that, we can look at the summary of PCA. Right, so it tells you that the, uh, these are the, the um, uh, amount of variation that's explained by the first, second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth, right, principal components. So we got 13 variables, so then you have 13 principal components, right? Um, <clears throat> if you look at the first few, like uh, first one explained 36% of the total variation, the second one 19%, um, the third one 11%, and so on and so forth, okay? So, um, So basically, the first few principal components up to the third one, they capture like about 66% uh, of the total variation, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> this is okay, uh, this is quite okay, uh, as long as your, your uh, cumulative proportion is not very uh, small, then there should be some kind of structure, right? Um, this looks quite pretty really okay. Now, um, there are many possible pairs or principal components that you can actually... So the next step is to look at the scatter plot, right? But there are many possible pairs, so uh, we can actually use a, a lattice plot, okay, to... Or, or sometimes called draftsman plot to actually simultaneously visualize them, okay? So before that, uh, we can actually also just type PCA. If you just type PCA, uh, right, so it will basically show you these things, okay? So basically, this, this values, uh, standard deviations are the, uh, I think they are the square root of the eigenvalues, okay? You can actually uh, do a check here by doing the following. You do eigen y without the eigen analysis, eigen decomposition of the uh, correlation matrix of wine without the first uh, column. Okay, so you can see that these are the eigenvalues, right? 4.7 something and all that, okay? So if you take this uh, values, this if you square it, it is about, uh, it should be close to 4.7, okay? Um, we can actually check that, uh, for example, let's see. You can actually extract the standard deviations as follows. Um, PCA, yes. okay. So this will extract the uh, standard deviation. And if you standard deviation, so basically these are just, just your eigen uh, square root of your eigenvalues. Okay, so you square that, you get this, right? If you look at the just now the eigen decomposition. So, over here, right, the values here, right? So you can look at these values. All 
All right. There seems to be a bit of lag. Okay. All right. Okay. So four point. Okay, you can see here, right? Four point seven. Okay, four point seven, right? So basically, uh, you now know that the output from uh, principal component, the standard deviation, if you square them, they become, they, they are just the eigenvalues, okay? All right. So then um, the next step is to actually uh, look at the pairwise uh, scatter plots so we can use uh, pairs, PCA scores. By the way, uh, you could actually look at all the objects in the PCA by using STR. Right, so it tells you that uh, the PCA PCA object that you constructed, right, the, that contains the analysis result from principal component analysis, and has all these things, uh, SDV loadings and so on and so forth, which you can actually um, extract out by using the dollar sign. Okay, so here the scores are the principal component scores. Okay, so we want to do the principal component scores, maybe the first four. All right, so we okay. So and then um, then we label the uh, samples with the uh, type. So we do it like. So there are actually three uh, variety, three types, right? So we, so I use the RGB here because I want to use transparency. Um, so I make the color transparent so that uh, we can see overlaps easily. Okay. So the first one is red. So RGB is red, green, blue. So you put them as uh, so if one zero zero means it's completely red, and this is the uh, uh, transparency controller. The second one I'll put green. And the third one, I will put uh, blue, okay, for simplicity. Generally, uh, it may be a better idea to choose colors uh, that are colorblind safe. Here, you, if you put red and green together, some, some people who are colorblind cannot actually distinguish them, all right? So uh, if you want to find out what are the safe colors, you go to this place called Color Brewer. Color Brewer dot org all right so there there's a they, they they actually have all these color safe combinations right okay so uh, we are not done yet so we're here and then um, a bit long here this one maybe i can chop it like this you don't actually have to chop it but i just chop it so that you can actually see it clearly all right and class uh, y right. okay and this one close all right okay this should actually work let me just copy this code and run it So you can see very clearly um, the output. So simultaneously, uh, it allows you to examine uh, pairs of scatter plots um, up to one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Up to six plots simultaneously, right? This is very useful to help you uh, decide uh, finally which plot you should use, okay? Uh, in principal component analysis, uh, most of the time, uh, the Structures may actually be seen already in the first two principal uh, scatter plot of the first two principal components, but that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes the structure actually uh, resides in the third principal component, or sometimes even the fourth. Okay, even though those structures they don't explain uh, a, a lot of the variation. All right, 
So um, there's actually no, um, so the, the only way you can actually safely uh, not miss any major structures is to actually check the first few, right? Use a, a pairwise scatter plot to actually check simultaneously across and then uh, pick the ones that are useful, right? Okay, so if you look at the current results, right? Uh, which of the principal components are actually uh, useful for uh, that means the uh, principal components that allow you to see structure in your data. Which ones? You can turn on your microphone and uh, just speak so that I don't have to look at the chat log. Okay. One and two. Okay, great. So I think uh, very clearly one and two. Now, uh, one, right, if you look at this uh, one, right, what is one primarily separating? So you have red, so you have the red cluster, the green cluster, and the blue cluster, right? So the first principal component is basically separating which, what structures? In fact, uh, if you look at here, right, your first principal component already is separating uh, um, uh, the structures quite well. If you look at this one, right, um, you look at this particular plot. So here, or, or you can actually look at this one, or even this one, right. Um, here you see that you, if you, if you kind of like uh, put a line over here, you get the, you separate out the, the blue clusters, right? You put a line here. So the green clusters are somewhere sitting in the middle and then the red clusters are sitting in the uh, bottom row, right? And this plot simply tells you that your third principal component has no separation power because over, you go around here, right? They all stack together, these three colors, okay? So you can't actually separate them on the second principal, uh, the third principal component. How about the second principal component? The second principal component is useful uh, for separating uh, the green cluster from the other two clusters, okay? Right, so, so I think uh, maybe using the first two should be okay, all right? Or in fact, if you want to be economical, maybe just the first one. But actually, uh, as you will see later, probably, uh, looking at uh, both of them will be more meaningful, all right? Okay, so this, from this plot, uh, we decide that we are going to look at the first two, two principal components, all right? Okay, so we can close this. So then we plot, right? Plot PCA scores uh, one, PCA scores two. And over here, the code will follow from here, right? So you just need to copy this and then paste here. And then you just run. Right, okay. So you get something like this. Um, if you want something um, clearer, so the, the dots are maybe a bit too small, so you could adjust that by um, inserting a, another argument. Maybe it's called a CEX. So this controls for the font size, right? So you put it to two, so it will be larger, right? The default is one. Close this. And, uh, run it again. Okay, so this is uh, much better, right? Okay, so later you might actually want to edit. Uh, usually the, the principal components here, you see that this is actually not uh, properly edited, right? So you could actually tidy up. Uh, so usually what we do is we just make the plot first. Um, if we want to retain the plot, then we tidy up, okay? So then we decide to tidy up so we can add the X label and the Y label, okay? Um, 
the X label is the first principal component, and the second label, the Y label is the second principal component. And sometimes we will put the amount of variation that's explained in the bracket. So to do this, we go back to the summary. So, uh, okay, we need to look at the summary. So, right, the first one is 36%, the second one is 19%, 19% right? So we, we can actually uh, put in a bracket here, 36%, and over here, 19%, right? Then we run this again. We'll run this again, we should get a, uh, where's the plot? Uh, okay, never mind, I just close it off first. All right, okay, so now you see that the, uh, the x axis and the y axis have been properly labeled, right? So you can actually uh, save this. Uh, if you are using Windows, you can actually save this, right? Uh, otherwise, if you use a MacBook, you have to um, maybe uh, you have to call out a you have to nest this here. Uh, for example, you call this a uh, so um, PNG. If you want to put up a PNG file, you have to put something like PNG, um, maybe let's say PCA line dot uh, PNG. And then you nest the code inside uh, below the this and then the something called device of. Okay. So if you do this, uh, you should be able to produce a, so it, the program will directly generate a figure on your desktop, right? So let's try this. Okay. So I can I can go to my desktop. Um, desktop I should have. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm not at the desktop. I actually at downloads. Okay. Right, so I, it, it will generate the plot inside your in in your current folder. I'm currently in the uh, downloads folder. So you can see here, right? So it's already uh, produced a plot in a file and then put it inside the folder. Okay, so that that can be very handy, right? Okay, so especially when you need to do uh, mass production of uh, like sometimes uh, if you have some big projects and you need to generate a lot of figures. You could actually uh, do a for loop and then kind of like uh, produce uh, figures, large numbers of figures and put them into a file uh, automatically, right? So that's for automation, okay? So anyway, um, so we got this plot, right? Now the next step is to find out uh, which are the, um, how, how, how the different, uh, variables affect the principal components, right? So one way to do this is actually to look at the loadings, okay? So you put PCA loadings. We just need the loadings for the first two principal components. Right? The two, okay. So keep these things away first, All right? Okay. So you can see that these are the uh, uh, coefficients, right? These are the loadings for the principal components. Use, so this, there are too many uh, decimal places here, so usually this will give you a bit of headache, right? Uh, they are not very, these this decimal places beyond the first two, they are not important. So you, could, you should actually try to round them, right? So um, you could actually do something like this. Uh, let's try this first. You round this by two, okay? So you, this, are, this is your data frame, right? So you basically 
so this is a, a data object. So you feed it into the function round. You run it to two decimal places, so you will be able to see um, the rounded figures. And this allows a better comparison, right? Okay, so you can see that uh, the in the first principal component, uh, those variables that push your uh, samples to the positive side, right? What are they? Okay, first we, we look at the first principal component. Which uh, variable has no uh, has very little or no influence on principal component one? Which variable? Ash. Ash, right? It's a zero, right? It is uh, almost zero. So uh, we can ignore ash, right? So ash has it's not important. It, it has no effect on the first principal component. Now, uh, color intensity is actually quite, it's actually a weak, but not close to zero. So we can keep that, right? We keep that because uh, it is a physical variable and there are not too many physical variables uh, in your data set, right? You only have color intensity, hue, and then the OD280, okay? So, so this is okay to keep. Now, so basically, what are those that are positive? Malic acid, so those that contribute to the positive, uh, that those that will push your samples to the right-hand side, right, the positive side, will be malic acid. So if your malic acid content is high, then when you multiply by the uh, uh, this positive coefficient, uh, co coefficient, so it will push it to the right-hand side, right? And of course, this is if you are using uh, a normalized uh, variables, it doesn't matter because uh, I know that after you normalize, sometimes you get negative values, right? But then uh, this is all relative, right? So uh, this is uh, those that are relatively uh, less negative will get pushed to the right-hand side, okay? It's all relative. So those that are large on the malic acid will be pushed on the right-hand side. Uh, ash alkalinity pushed to the right-hand side. Non-flavonoid phenol, right-hand side. Okay, so basically the, the, those that go to the right-hand side are because they are high in these uh, three things, okay? And they are concurrently low on those that are negative, okay? So those that push to the negative side are uh, uh, all this, okay? So basically your first uh, principal component is a kind of contrast, right? It's a contrast between uh, malic acid, ash alkalinity, and color intensity against uh, and non-flavonoid phenol, those that have positive loading, the contrast of that, that set of variables against the other set of variables, okay? And then for your second principal component, your ash alkalinity is not important, it's almost zero, okay? Flavonoid also not important, right? Um, this also you can throw away, like right? this non-flavonoid phenol and all that. They are basically, the important ones are very interestingly, you look, note that color intensity, one of the physical variables, okay? Very high uh, loading. Um, and then there's an alcohol, malic acid, ash, okay? So this is actually quite a bit uh, for details, right? But it's a little bit difficult to digest them, right? Uh, by just kind of, with some effort, you may be able to keep them uh, in, in check, but uh, usually uh, it will help if you have a by plot, okay? So let's make a by plot. So the main uh, value of this by plot is the correlation vectors, all right? So we will show this. Um, in am I? Okay. Um, easy. Uh, if you are using, if you are using a uh, um, Windows uh, X11 bracket, will call up a new uh, window so that you can display multiple uh, figures at the same time. But I'm not sure it, it doesn't work that well in MacBook. So where's the? Okay, I'll just redo this. Okay, so this is a by plot, right? If you notice uh, just now, uh, I'll just open this. Okay. 
Okay, so this was the plot that we got just now, right? So your your basically your buy plot is showing the same structure, right? This part is the green one, the blue one, and this part is the red, right? And you can see that uh, the arrows here they tell you a lot, okay? For example, uh, you see that this is the these are the blue ones, right? Uh, the blue ones they are high in malic acids, alkali ash, alkalinity, non-flavonoid, phenol. Okay, they are high. That's why they they uh, get pushed into this place, right? You should think of you can actually think of this as uh, this. These are the forces of the variables and how they push the the samples into the uh, some kind of a uh, position in in this space, all right? So this is very uh, very powerful uh, way to understand uh, structure in your data. Okay, so for this part here, now you see that this part here is very distinct, right? The principal component, a positive principal component, but the rest of these uh, they have a negative second principal component, right? The primary cause of this uh, pushing them to have the uh, positive principal component is because they are high in the hue and then the OD280, right? And this is very interesting because uh, this is telling you that um, some of these varieties, in fact, uh, if you only have the physical characteristics, you more or less can, can know them already. You don't actually need to um, measure the, the chemical uh, uh, variables because of the correlation, okay? So uh, this is very interesting. And over here for this group, uh, they are primarily strong in the flavonoids, um, phenol, total, proline, and alcohol, right? So this group here, the this this cluster of uh, samples here, they are high in alcohol, okay? All right. So those that are coming on this side are high in alcohol. Those on the opposite side will be low, all right? So this is how you uh, you can imagine that there's an opposite here, right? So those that get pushed here will be high. Those that are on the opposite side will be low, all right? Okay, so, so this is uh, simultaneously giving you a lot of information. And then uh, not only that, the uh, angles between the vectors actually tell you uh, more or less the correlation between those two uh, variables. For example, so the angle here is very small, right? The cosine of the angle, okay? Uh, this Q and OD280, the angle here is very small. So these two values are strongly correlated, okay? Cosine of this angle, cosine of zero is one, right? So a cosine of a small angle is uh, um, uh, large, okay? So the correlation between two variables is more or less equal to the cosine of the angle. So the angle is very informative here. And in fact, you see that this Q and the malic acid, right? is totally uh, negatively correlated, okay? And this, again, is very interesting. By, by knowing the hue, right, you can actually know whether the, the wine will be more or less sour or less sour, okay? Uh, with a malic acid content that's high, it will be uh, a little bit sour, okay? So, so uh, in fact, uh, this is a uh, wine uh, some people, right, by, by just looking at the characteristics, they can tell you that, um, you know, um, this, this, this uh, particular drink will taste in such and such a way. Um, they, of course, they gain it from experience, right? But really, uh, all these things, you can actually learn it from data, okay? So, in fact, this is very interesting. Um, Q here is uh, completely negatively correlated with malic acid. So, Knowing the hue information will tell you a lot about the malic acid content without actually tasting it and without actually um, measuring it, all right? You can measure hue very easily using a colorimeter, okay? And, and that, that is a, a very interesting um, relationship that you can find in the by plot. And then what else? Um, you can actually look at these things, like for example, the flavonoids here, right? This flavonoid is totally... Uh, negatively correlated with uh, non-flavonoid phenols, okay? So when one is uh, high, the other is low, and also negatively correlated with alkalinity. Uh, maybe people with some chemistry background, they might be able to appreciate this better, all right? Um, and then what else? Okay, so you can actually look at those also
also look at those relationships that are orthogonal, right? Uh, if, if two angles are more or less 90 degrees, the cosine of that is close to zero, okay? So if you look at this uh, hue, you, know, you look at hue and uh, alcohol content. This angle here is almost 90 degrees, right? Okay? And which is telling you that you, you can't really tell whether uh, the wine has high alcohol content or not by just looking at the color, okay? The hue. So this is uh, actually uh, interesting. Um, there's no information about that, right? Uh, you could probably look at some other um, uh, relationships that are orthogonal, okay? So I'll leave that to you. Like, for example, uh, magnesium, right? You look at magnesium here and malic acid, okay? Uh, they are not correlated, right? They're orthogonal. So malic acid is not correlated with magnesium, all right? So knowing if, if, if the drink tastes slightly sour, uh, don't know anything about its magnesium content, all right? So that's basically what it means, okay? So this biplot uh, is, is very interesting in the sense that it allows you to do a lot of interpretation, okay? But um, it will be uh, better if you have some way of summarizing the correlation structures, right? So one way to do this is uh, the following. Um, we can actually use a, a package called the core plot. Uh, let me check whether I have this. Okay, I have this core plot, all right? So we do a correlation plot of uh, the correlation between the variables do that. Right, um, where did the graph go? So, here, I have to kind of like, okay, just do the device off first. Um, the R okay right so okay so basically this uh, produces a uh, pairwise correlation plot uh, basically it is just uh, turning the correlation values into a color right so that you can visualize it easily okay uh, now on its own, this is not very useful because there's no structure, you see. There, uh, there's some structure, but it's not actually clear from just a simple uh, display. So you need to kind of like cluster cluster the uh, correlations by similarity. So you do some kind of clustering. So you order a clustering. So uh, we will make it a bit more... Detail here. So uh, method uh, uh, hash method equals to hash cluster. So don't worry about this. Uh, you can actually find out this by using a question mark call plot to actually see information about uh, what are the arguments that it will further accept. Okay, I just show you how this can be done. Um, This should be you put what and this one. Okay, I don't quite remember. Let me check this. Um, order. Okay, this should be order. This is the method is. Uh, Let's try this first. Where did that screen go?
Okay, the R console. Yeah. Okay, so right. Maybe it's better to put uh, method equals to color. So basically you get this, right? Um, this is very nice. Uh, this figure tells you a lot about the uh, uh, correlations, right? Between the uh, variables. Okay, you can see that the variables that have uh, bluish color, so these are the high positive correlations. They have been grouped together into one block here. And you can actually look at uh, groups here. They are basically possibly like uh, there's one group here then there's uh, another group here in the middle, and then there's a weaker group around here, right? So you can see that uh, Hue, Pro, Anthocyanin, OD280, and all that, these are all uh, strongly correlated, all right? If you check the uh, bipod just now, you will find that they, they actually, um, the, the, the cosine of the angle is very small, right? So you can actually double check uh, the bipod um, with this uh, correlation plot, okay? And you can see the negative correlation here, right? Just now we look, we look at the hue, right? Hue and malic acid, you see here, the correlation is negative, right? So it's actually quite negative, around 0.6, something like this, okay? Right? Um, and then you have uh, some other interesting things, which is the color intensity uh, is actually strongly correlated with uh, alcohol, okay? So, uh, basically, you, so th this, this uh, is interesting because the color itself actually uh, has some, uh, it will tell you something about, uh, the more intense it is, uh, then the correspondingly the alcohol content is a bit higher, all right? Okay? And um, and then that's it, right? So th this tells you that there basically there are three groups of um, variables. This is the correlation structure, right? And this gives you some kind of idea, right? Because uh, if, if a group of variables are all correlated, then basically there's uh, some redundancy, right? Because if you know one, then basically you can know the other one, right? So this gives you some idea on cutting down on the uh, number of variables, okay? Cutting down the number of variables that you can actually um, use to, to describe structure in your data, right? And this may be useful if uh, some kind of uh, machine learning uh, uh, context is required whereby people usually want to make predictions uh, based on the uh, smallest possible set of predictors because collecting data costs money. So they would like to identify such a set, right? They, but initially when they do the research, they will have uh, large numbers of variables, okay? So then uh, by, uh, because of this correlation structure, usually we will pick up those variables that are easy to measure and cheap to measure, right? And that should be enough, okay? okay. So in this, uh, based on this result here, right? Uh, which of the variables do you think um, you should actually keep? Like if you suppose you want to reduce your data set into a smaller data set, um, and then you get to choose just a few uh, of these variables, right? Which would you choose? Of course, bearing in mind that the, the variable that you choose here should be easy to measure. Any ideas?
Any ideas from the students? Yes, Jalen. Color and intensity with alcohol. Al alcohol should be a simple variable that you can uh, measure, right? So that, that we can keep that, right? Uh, okay, so we can pick, we can, if you, you can pick alcohol, right? Um, okay, fine. Uh, color intensity and alcohol, uh, okay. And what else? Flavonoid or maybe malic acid. Uh, but flavon, okay, those things will require you to use a chemical assay, so that, that may be more expensive to collect. Here is uh you would be the first first to consider. Okay. So basically, I think uh, we can actually try. Um, well, this is not definitive, right? It is just uh, getting ideas. Okay. So uh, first thing is you look at this first block, right? Q and the OD two eight zero. This these are very easy to measure uh, variables. Okay. So we can consider that. Um, and we can also consider color intensity and alcohol, right? So let's consider these four variables, okay? So we kept the three physical variables and then one chemical variable that is easy to measure, right? As alcohol content, easy to measure. So uh, let's try that. We create a subset, right? We call a wine subset. Uh, use this function, subset of wine. Um, you select those variables that you want, right? So you there are four of them. So they are just put them in Q. Okay, um OD two eight zero O D three one five color intensity. alcohol okay so we can select this create this subset All right so you can look at the uh, subset that's been created okay so it basically only has uh, oh, okay um, I should include the type as well. Right. So I run this again. Adjust this a little bit, okay. Right. So, um, and then we repeat the principal component, okay, analysis. But uh, you can just copy this code here. And then put it here. And then basically, you just need to change uh, the name, right? Maybe call it a subset. Okay, so let's run this and see what happens. Right, okay, so you got the plot here, right? 
Okay, so what do you see here? Do you still see structure? It's still possible, right? Uh, in fact, uh, your structure here is still more or less intact. Uh, you have you have the uh, first principal component uh, basically separating the blue cluster with the red and the green. All right, and then the uh, second principal component basically separating. Um, after you do the separation here, you can separate on the second principal component between the red and the green, right? So, so still possible, right? So even though you have uh, reduced the number of variables, you're still able to achieve the separation, okay? Of course, this is not, uh, like I said just now, um, whether you do this or not, it actually depends on uh, what your client actually wants, right? If your client wants to do something that is going more towards prediction, this is probably something that you want to advise. But if your client wanted to, to know, right, uh, what characterizes the, the three types of wines, right? Then you, you don't want to do this because uh, he actually, this person may be actually interested in, in you know, the magnesium, the phenols and, and all that kind of things, okay? So I, I, what I'm try, trying to show you here is that I'm showing you all the possible things that you can actually consider um, from, from uh, this analysis, okay? All right. So based on this one, you can of course also look at the byplots of the subset, right? You run this, uh, this is your byplot, okay? So basically, uh, again, uh, it's telling you that those, so those those uh, samples that are high in alcohol content will get pushed down at the second component, okay? And those, so basically those that are on the uh, push, push down here, they are high in alcohol content and they are high in this OD280, okay? And uh, those that are towards the right-hand side, they are more influenced by the hue, right? Of course, the OD280 also influences the uh, push to the right-hand side, right? Those that are towards the left hand side have a strong color intensity. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, this this is uh, telling you how to do a basically uh, doing a subset analysis uh, uses the same code as you would. Uh, it's just that you change the the data set, right? So now now once you have all these things, it will be very interesting to actually compare. Uh, the mean, right? The mean of this, uh, all these variables in the three types, okay? Okay, so we want to find out the mean. Now in R, right, there is a very efficient way of uh, finding this out uh, easily using a one-liner, okay? So the function to use is something called t-apply, right? Okay? So do t apply okay then you give the uh, for example um, the type and uh, maybe say this is a uh, magnesium right so you want to find out the mean so you want to for magnesium split according to the types and you want to find the mean Okay, let's try to see what this gives you. Okay, so it gives you the mean of um, magnesium in the three groups, right? So you don't have to actually uh, do them manually, okay? So you can just call them up. So what if you actually want to do this across all the variables, right? Let's look at the variable again. So you actually want to do this across uh, all the variables and not just for one by one, all right? So for this, uh, to do things across a, a, a columns or rows in the data frame, right? You use the function apply, okay? So the data set is wine. You go by two, two means you go by column, okay? 
and then uh, you want to do you want to apply the function right the function is this function right so function this case is a generic uh, index so t apply uh, k so this k will uh, represent this generic uh, data vector right and this one is fixed because you want to split them by one type and then finally you want to find out the mean okay let's try this and see what happens right you see very clearly that uh, in fact we okay we don't want the first one because the first one is just basically the type let's run this again right okay so you can actually see the uh, result here let me just okay so the mean for one two three and uh, come out right so you can see that based on just the mean right um they have different color so so like for example uh alcohol content type one is 13.7 this is the red one right red green and blue okay because i specified according to the uh one for red two for green three for blue of course you can use different color coding no problem but the color coding that i use uh was uh red green and blue okay so the red one is uh 13.7 high alcohol content okay and then uh what were the other things that we saw were interesting uh od280 right okay uh, this one is about three okay color intensity is the third type right so you should actually use this to support um as now we um we have the by plot okay let's make the by plot it's better to display this simultaneously let me make the by plot So I have um, PCA plot, a by plot. Yeah, put them side by side, right? Okay. Uh, and then I show you this. Okay. So you can have a. Uh, check here right let me just rearrange this okay so uh you can see that those okay so this group right the green color right green is uh, group two they should be quite high in the hue and the od280 okay group two you look at this one right they are quite high in the hue and OD280 okay it's also high right um, but then they should be because they are opposite of color intensity they should have the lowest color intensity right you, if you check here indeed uh, among these three right they actually have the lowest color intensity all right and also they should have low ash so if you check uh, ash is here but it's not very strong right this is a 2.4 is 2.2 you can find it out from the length of the ash right it's actually very it's actually quite short and and the green one should also be lower in alcohol content right because it's opposite of uh, alcohol is pulling to a negative second principle component whereas they are on the positive side so as you can see here the mean is actually um, low uh, the lowest among the three types okay and uh what else can we confirm uh verify so like for example flavonoids right so the red one is the um first group so flavonoids pulling to the left so you can see here 2.98 the highest one okay so um, all this information they kind of like complement each other all right and um depending on what what you want to actually focus on you can later actually like for example uh if you want to focus on certain kinds of uh, variables and discuss them 
then you can actually do a box plot, right? You can do a box plot to compare. Uh, like, for example, if you want to discuss differences in um, flavonoid, you can actually make a uh, box plot, right? And how do we, how do we make that? So uh, box plot, easy to call here. So you just do a box plot. Um, here you want to do uh, the, uh, let me see. So this should be uh, your flavonoids, uh, it's depending on type, the data is mine. Let's see if this works. Okay, it works, right. So then you have this, okay? So this is a type one, type two, type three, right? You can see that the uh, distribution is actually it's overlapping, uh, but the uh, distribution of the flavonoid, so the flavonoid for type 1 is actually not overlapping with the type 3, okay? Right? So that, that can be a very strong separator, right? Okay? In fact, if you want to put colors here, you can still kind of like put color, put in the color vector. Um, just put red, green, and blue, okay. Uh, try this again. Uh, Oh, forgot the C, right? Okay. Got the uh, concatenation, so. Um, oh, okay, there is. This should actually work. Okay. okay, right. Okay, so you can actually uh, tidy up later, right? So, so uh, like I said, uh, this will be very helpful for you to focus on which uh, selected uh, univariate uh, variable that you might want to uh, talk about, all right, if, if there's an interest in it, okay? But usually for this kind of data set, we don't do, uh, so, so we start with multivariate, all right, and then we selectively, if we, there's an interest in some of the particular variables, then we focus on them. Um, the, if, you, if you give this data set to beginners, right, a lot of time, uh, because they don't know how to do multivariate uh, methods, so they will just do uh, large numbers of univariate uh, comparisons, okay? Um, that is uh, not going to help you discover important patterns, right? For example, those, those uh, correlations between the variables uh, are not, not easy to find, okay, uh, if you don't have the biplot, all right? Okay, so... Um, so, so this is the, uh, some aspects. And then I want to show you one uh, additional method which is called the heat map, right? Um, so for the heat map, I have already downloaded uh, the code. So this is the code and I'll just uh, put it somewhere, okay? So I can close this uh, figures now, right? So, let's see. All right, so um, here, 
if you want to use a heat map, right? So let me show you how to do this. All right. So uh, you have to first install a, a an R package called gplots. Okay. So um, you can do that by using install dot um, packages. Okay. Then you put gplots, right? All right, so if you have already done that, you just need to call the library. Okay, just uh, call the library here. And then it will, you will have access to uh, the heat map dot two function, right? Now, um, when you want to do a heat map, right, uh, you have to normalize your data because uh, if, if the scale of your variables uh, are very different, um, then of course you can't, uh, doing a heat map directly will not give you any, um, you just get artifacts, right? So you need to normalize the data. So you can either do the uh, Z score, right? So you subtract mean divide by standard deviation. Or another way that I find uh, is more reasonable uh, and actually quite easy to understand is ranking. So basically just rank the, your variables, okay? So your normalization is by ranking, right? Now, uh, that means the rank one will correspond to small values. The larger ranks will correspond to larger values, okay? So large rank means large values. Small ranks means small values, okay? And that, that seems very straightforward to me. And I think this uh, normalization actually uh, works quite well in practice, which you can try. So basically, uh, first thing is you can actually uh, basically just uh, run this part. So this part is just maybe basically some kind of a color selection that I've already done. So uh, you can use them directly. So there's nothing much here. Okay. Uh, if you want to change this later, you can do it yourself, right? Uh, like for example, this one is just the color tone. Later you will see on the... So basically, you just need to change these things while keeping the structure, okay? Uh, this uh, red, green, blue are the color labels, okay? I used red, green, and blue just now as uh, now, okay? Now, this uh, ranking, so I do a transformation here. So basically, for the wine data, right, uh, except the first uh, column, which is the class label, I basically just rank them, okay? So go by the columns, and then I do ranking, right? So then I create ranking. So you can actually check the ranked data. Right, so they've been converted into ranks. All right. Uh, if they are, you sometimes you get 0.5 and all that because they are ties. Okay, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so then after that, uh, you just run this block of code, right? You don't have to change anything. Uh, this has already been optimized, okay? So just run it. Uh, basically, you just need to supply your uh, data frame here, right? Of course, the ranked one here, uh, remember it should not contain your class label, okay? Please, please make sure that it doesn't contain your class label. Otherwise, you'll get um, artifacts, all right? So this is what you get. Okay, and this is actually quite a very rich graph. So you can see that the samples are arranged uh, on the uh, columns here, right? Whereas your x-axis here, they are the variables, okay? And they have also been clustered by similarity, right? So you can see that there are actually uh, one cluster here, two and three, right? So the clustering pattern uh, is actually quite similar to the one that you got from the core plot, right? Um, if you, you can actually refer back uh, just now that you saw one block where the hue, uh, pro and to sign in, OD, 3, uh, 280, and flavonoids, they are all in one block, right? Now you actually see them together, okay? So they are clustered into one block here, and there's another block here, there's another block here, okay? But of course, um, uh, you have to be careful with the heat map because... Uh, how you choose the distance function and which algorithm you use to do the clustering uh, affects the result, okay? 
So um, this this uh, combination has been optimized already, okay, uh, from experience. So you use uh, basically you can use the Euclidean distance, and then uh, the clustering algorithm use the Watt algorithm, okay. So from from experience, I found that this this combination actually works most of the time, okay. So you can use that, okay. So then you have the red color is the color labels, okay, and then blue and then the green, right. As you can see, the grouping, right? So most of the samples are actually grouped uh, almost uh, without any kind of error, except that the green color, uh, occasionally, the one or two of them gets, uh, they gets into uh, the red cluster and the blue cluster, okay? There are some red also that are clustered together here, all right, with the green. But actually, that's not surprising because uh, just now when you look at the principal component plots, we saw that there's some kind of at the edges of the cluster, there are some uh, overlaps, right? So so those are those cases, right? The borderline cases, okay? So the, those are not very important, right? Because uh, most data will behave like this. You have borderline cases, okay? So you, you cannot expect uh, them to have a very clear-cut uh, properties, okay? Um, but this is good enough. Most of them are clear cut enough. Okay, so what you can study from the heat map is to uh, see. So you can see that the the your eyes will guide you, right? The light color here means that the values are low, right? Because the ranks are low. So you can see that the blue color uh, type, right? They are actually relatively low on the hue, proanthocyanin, OD280, phenol, and flavonoids. Okay. So is that actually true? We can actually go back and uh, check the uh, just now the, the those values, right? Let's check these values again. Of course, you could actually store them and then uh, call them up, right? Be much easier, okay? Um, blue is actually type three, okay? So just now we have um, look at the. Not, uh, um, where did the file go? All right, so look at this here. It, uh, the blue one is type 3, it should be low on the hill, okay, which you'll find that it is the, the case. Uh, pro anthocyanin also low, so let's check for pro anthocyanin. It's also the lowest here, right? Okay, and flavonoids, flavonoids. Okay, zero point seven eight, right? So basically, uh, it's not surprising that you have a block here because these variables they are correlated, right? So when one is low, the the rest are low, okay? And uh, that means this uh, type three, right? They are characterized characterized by. So if you want to have a description, right? In fact, this will help you. Um, this description will help you more than a principal component plot. Basically, you can just say that uh, uh, the type three is characterized by low amounts of flavonoids, phenol, proanthocyanin, uh, right? And physically, they are characterized by low. Uh, values of um, OD280 and Q, okay? And then you can give the mean, all right? Of course, you can give the mean and then the standard deviation, right? So the standard deviation, basically, you just need to replace the mean with SD, right? So basically, these are your standard deviations, okay? So so you can uh, fill in the details like that, right? Um, and then, of course, the red one, they are characterized by strong ones, right? You see the block here is all dark color, right? Uh, this block here, they are more heterogeneous. Do you see that the colors have some more variance, right? Uh, colors have some, they are not quite all light or all dark, but there's a mixture, right? So they are more heterogeneous with respect to this uh, content, okay? And in fact, if you look at the uh, types, right? Okay. Uh, if you just look at this figure here, um, what can they 
tell you about the variability of um, in terms of their, their chemical uh, variables. How, how variable it is. Like for example, if you pick, you pick a sample from the blue, uh, pick a sample from the, you pick samples from red, pick samples from green and pick samples from blue, right? A blue and green, right? Which, which of the uh, types would you expect to have uh, more variation in terms of um, the chemical variables? Is it the, the red, the blue or the green? Any, any suggestions? Uh, Amy, Amy, are you around? Yeah, you, you want to have a comment? about the uh, plot just now? Actually, this is actually quite easy to see. Uh, you look at this, this block here, right? The blocks here, they, their colors tend to be like, for example, with respect to this, this variables, right? They, they are all, what, what is the variance of the, so you can tell the variance by looking at how different the colors are, right? Which one is uh, more consistent? Is it, for, let, let's say if you focus on just this block, okay, this block here, which one is more consistent, the red, the blue, or the green? Consistent in the sense that the colors are more or less the same and less heterogeneous. Red. Red is uh, less heterogeneous or more? Less. Less. Less, less right? Because they, they are more or less all dark colored, right? Whereas you look at this one, the green one, right? Uh, although kind of like a lot of them are light, but you also see that uh, quite some of them are dark, right? So there's a heterogeneity in this group, which is actually when you look at this, right? Um, it's telling you the wine from this uh, type two, right? They are more, there's more variation in terms of their properties and the taste. Although they, they are claimed to come from this region, but there is actually more variation, okay? Which means if, if somebody samples uh, wine from this region, right, they should expect that the, the, uh, the taste and all that will be quite variable, okay? Whereas if they sample from the red region, right, they should expect that the, the properties are more or less similar. This is the kind of information that you can get from uh, this heat map, right? So you, you can kind of like have some idea about the variability, okay, with respect to these variables. And this is, I think, a uh, 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 main advantage of uh, supplementing your principal component plot with, with a heat map, okay, to improve your understanding of structure in the data, okay. Of course, uh, this is uh, just, we're talking about this particular example, right, but it applies um, to any other kinds of um, data set where you have uh, this kind of structure, okay? Like you have different types. So you can be, uh, it can be coffee, for example. You have coffee grown in uh, different, uh, different coffee varieties, for example. Uh, Javanica and 
those kind of Arabica things. And then they have different acidity. They have different kinds of uh, chemical compounds and and uh, things like that, right? So uh, you, may, you may be wondering like uh, whether Arabica, they are more consistent or Liberica, they are more consistent and all that, right? So uh, in a similar way, you can collect similar kinds of data. It's just that instead of wine, you just have coffee, right? So, but the analysis, the approach is the same, okay? It's just that the subject matter changed, okay? So this is, um, I think, a very useful data set for exploring um, some ideas in consulting, right? Because uh, there are many things that we can talk about, okay? Depending on what, what is the client's uh, uh, desired um, uh, advice, okay? Right, okay. So I think uh, that is all I want to talk about for the uh, analysis, okay, um, in terms of R. Are there any questions from from you? No. This is one of the clustering methods, right? Yeah, when you do heat map, you actually have uh, it simultaneously also does the clustering on the uh, rows and columns, okay? That's why you have, uh, so you see, the, you, you also have clustering occurring on the rows and also on the columns, all right? So um, it complements your, your principal component uh, analysis. The principal component analysis will give you some ideas on uh, um, variable reduction, okay, dimensional reduction. But this one, it gives you something, uh, some idea about the group properties, okay. So here, the three R codes that uh, we look at uh, the PCA uh, codes, then the correlation plot co uh, codes, and then you have the heat map codes, okay? So uh, for your assignment one, uh, you could actually try uh, these methods, okay? And uh, try to get some kind of insights from the urine data set, okay? So, are there any further questions? Cha Chong, any questions from you? Am I going to talk about, oh yeah, this just uh, reminded me, okay. Um, all right, so we have some time, right? Let's look at the, okay, have I downloaded the data? Let me see, downloads, uh, urine, okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about the missing value, okay. So let's look at this. Um, So you have, basically you have a missing value uh, for some of the data, only two, right? Um, in this question, you could actually uh, very quickly identify them. So, um, so it's okay if you just, uh, so basically you need to inspect the data set for this. There's a quick way to identify this. So. 
So if you want to find out which are the rows that have missing data, right? So you go by row one and then you look at, um, uh, do the following. So basically you check uh, whether there's any missing data and then you add up everything, right? So, um, sorry, it's sorry, wrong. Be like this. Okay. All right. So then, um, those that have one, right, are the rows where you have missing value. Okay. So you can have ID missing uh, is which. Okay. Uh, let me see which which is equal to one. Okay. So ID missing is one and fifty five. Okay. So then you know that um, sample one and sample fifty five they have missing values. All right. Now let's look at uh, those two values. So you win ID missing. Okay, so the first uh, sample is missing M M H O value. The second one is missing M O S M value. Okay. Now, can you give me some suggestions how we can actually guess these two values? So they they are missing because uh, maybe the it kind of like got lost or something. All right. Uh, usually in the Consulting session uh, setting, you might actually want to talk to the client first to understand uh, what is the cost, right? Because they are the ones who generated the data and they know it best. Uh, but if they don't know, then then you will have to make some decision whether you want to impute them or not, right? But uh, generally, in consulting session, just ask them about possible reasons, okay? But over here. Um, what, what is the strategy that you can actually use? Can you make some suggestions? If you want to guess this value, how? Any suggestions? Mean for that variable. Uh, okay. Median, okay. Uh, Jingjia, any Zhou Jingjia, any uh, ideas? Jingjia is here. Now the range first remove. Okay. Well, we already export the idea of removing, right? Which is basically. Um, Something that we uh, should try not to do because uh, first thing when you remove these things, right, you basically create a bias in your data set, right? Uh, and second thing, uh, removing things simply means that you don't know how to deal with it, so you remove it. But that's more like a, a, a kind of a, what we call that the, the uh, uh, there's a kind of bird that, that buries its neck in the sand when it sees trouble. What, what bird is that? What do you call that? Uh, a cassowary bird or something like that. Okay, never mind. Um, so, okay, so, now you studied multivariate data sets. All of them are characterized by correlations, right? Some of the, a lot of these variables that you collect, they are all correlated, right? So, so how can you use that to your advantage? If two variables are strongly correlated, right? What does that tell you? It tells you that if you know one, you know the rest. You know one, you know the other, right? With a high degree of uh, accuracy, isn't it? Okay. So, so yes, how, how should you predict the value? First thing, you should actually see uh, which variable is strongly correlated to the missing value, right? Okay, the variable that you have missing, right? So what should we do at the beginning? 
to explore the data. There are many possibilities, right? So pH could be correlated, specific gravity could be correlated, which one? so there are many pairs, right? So, so the first starting point would be to use pairs, right? Okay, so you could actually look at pairs. Uh, basically, you'll just recycle the code that you use. So your pairs of urine. Um, basically, the color is the same. Just now, you use a uh, red, green, okay, this one is a uh, uh, okay, so you have to, so that's not good, so you have to remove the first First uh, column and at PCH sixteen. Okay. So uh, the correlation. Take note that the correlation structure may be actually different in. Uh, the group with crystal and no crystal, right? So you have to make a distinction between the blue and the red. So maybe the blue and the red is, sorry, the, the green and the red. So maybe that's not very, it's not very clear. So maybe let me see. Uh, I uh, reduce the trans, I increase, the reduce the transparency a bit. Maybe this one. Right. Okay, so can you tell me? Uh, so red for the first group, right? So the first one is, uh, what is missing? Sorry. Um, the first one is uh, MMHO is missing, right? So MMHO is correlated with what? MMHO is here, right? In the red group, is it correlated strongly with what variable? Specific gravity? So you focus on the red color, eh? How about pH? Definitely not, right? Because your correlation between the pH and the MMHO is very weak, right? So among these, which one is better? MOSM. Yeah, MOSM, right? This is a O. So your MMHO is correlated very strongly with uh, MOSM, okay? So basically, uh, to make things simple, you can actually use a regression, right? You build a regression model between MOSM and uh, MMHO, uh, sorry, your, you use your response, you have to pick the response. So in this case, uh, since your missing is MMHO, but you have MOSM, so you use your response as MMHO and your predictor as MOSM, right? So you build a model for uh, those two variables in the uh, urine data set, okay? So let me see. So you can do a model like this, okay? Um, LM, um, okay, maybe I create the subset first. Urine crystal, um, uh, urine one is the subset of uh, urine, uh, where the crystal is. is equal to one, okay? You look at urine one, so basically that's your subset, right? Then you can create a model uh, one, LM, linear regression, okay? 
So you're going to regress uh, MMHO with respect to MOSM. So data is uh, urine.1, okay? Look at model 1. So that's your model, okay? So let's look at the summary of the model. Alright? So this will tell you whether the uh, slope, the intercept and the slope uh, and coefficients are significantly different from zero, okay? So from here, you'll find that um, only the slope is significant, right? 0 0.03, whereas the intercept is not significant, okay? So when you notice that, uh, what you should do is to make some adjustment. So your model here, so your model should not include the intercept, right? So you put a zero plus, okay? Then you rerun, and then you look at the summary. So basically now you have your estimate of the uh, MOSM is 0 0.036, okay? So basically your model is uh, MO, MMOH equals to 0 0.036 times MOSM, okay? So then this is very nice. Uh, so you can actually extract your model one, uh, you type co-f, right? So it will give you the uh, coefficients. So basically then um, what happens is you, if you look at your missing data, right? Um, uh, that's the win ID missing, okay. So, so this guy here, you basically just need to replace NA with 725 times this one, okay? So what do you do? So you have urine missing, that's the first one, right? First one, uh, MMHO, okay? Is now equal to the model coefficient multiplied by uh, urine one MOSM, okay? So you, you look at urine one. Um, oh, actually, it has not been replaced. Uh, let me see. Let me do some checking here. So this is twenty six point one nine. So let me see. It's, it's not. Uh, I think you cannot substitute it directly like that. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Use G sub. Um, okay. The simplest one maybe you just do fix um, urine. Okay. So then you just edit this value, right? 26.19812, okay? Close it. And then you look at urine again. So, it should actually work. I'm not sure why it introduced one column here. But never mind, you can actually get rid of that column uh, later, right? So what I wanted to show you was, uh, how to make the imputation, right? And uh, this is 26 point something. So you can see that this imputation is actually quite good because you look at, you have something like 668, right? The MMHO is 25.3, okay? So this is actually quite reasonable guess, okay? If you had used the mean, right, what would you get? So if you use the mean, right, you have to be very careful. Um, you have to use the mean of the, uh, subgroups, okay? Say, for example, MMHO. Um, of course, this has already included the imputed value, but uh, NA remove. 20.55, right? So it's a big distance away. It's somewhat like quite different from the one that you got from regression, right? Uh, I think in this problem, uh, you will agree with me if re if you if regression is actually a better method to do the imputation, right?
because you are exploiting the interrelatedness of the correlation between the variables to make the proper kind of guess. Okay, and um, that's usually a very useful skill, right? Uh, in order to know one variable, you don't actually need to measure it. You can use an associated uh, variable to actually guess it, right? If the correlation is strong, okay? So then it goes for the second. So in the second missing data, right? What is missing is MOSM, okay? So MOSM and green, right? Uh, which one is strong, the correlation? MOSM and... Uh, and MOSM is strongly correlated with which variable for the green group? Gravity. Can you see? This is MOSM. So you'll find, so you check against uh, maybe this one, this one, this one, or this one. So which one? Either urea or specific gravity. Okay, uh, urea is a good choice. All right, I think uh, specific uh, gravity. I think uh, there are some problems with this uh, data points here. Right, this this kind of like, uh, outliers. They will affect your regression line. Okay, so I think uh, maybe the urea is better. Right, the the spread around the line is actually much less. Even though this one, uh, the bulk is also fitting quite well, but there are a few of these outliers um, disturbing it, okay? And also you'll note that uh, specific gravity, the range of the values is actually very small, okay? So a small value can actually uh, make a big difference, right? So uh, possibly based on that, uh, I would actually pick, I will actually try uh, an imputation that's based on uh, regressing um, MOSM against uh, urea, okay? So you use the same idea, you can uh, impute the value for MOSM for the second group, okay? So this is telling you that even when you do imputation, be careful. Uh, you have got to pick the correct imputation um, uh, strategy, right? That is based on the, the patterns of association specific to that, that uh, particular cluster, a particular group. So if you can't actually look at the entire data set, if you just look at the entire data set, uh, you might be misled, right? Because it contains a mixture. And when you look at correlations, right? In linear regression modeling, it's always uh, assumed that the observations are all coming from the same process, okay? Then if, if now we, it's very clear that your observations come from two different processes, right? So if you use all of them in the regression model, you will make a mistake, okay? So please be careful with um, this part, all right? Okay, so once you have done this, uh, so I also hope that this gives you some idea to do imputation for future projects if you come across them. Uh, of course, if the degree of uh, missingness is, is severe, then your imputation may not work very well. So, uh, and sometimes uh, instead of a simple regression, you might actually need to use multiple regression, right? Uh, multiple regression, of course, will produce a more accurate kind of prediction. But in this case, I think uh, a simple regression will just do. To do uh, multiple regression to impute, uh, there's an R package called uh, MICE, M-I-C-E, right? You could try that. Uh, it's called M-I-C-E, okay? For, for um, uh, multi-variable uh, regression, uh, imputation, okay? All right, okay. So I think, uh, so I covered the missing data part. So you can actually do the imputation and then work with the imputed data set and then um, try to follow the uh, methods that I talked about today to, to uh, gain some kind of insights about the data, all right? And present it in a report that, that uh, is understandable, okay? All right, okay, so that will be, um, so that will be okay, right? Uh, what we want to cover for today, all right? So I hope uh, you will try this uh, uh, thing soon.
I will post up the R code uh, in a while, okay? So that you can uh, actually uh, go and practice on the uh, new data set, okay? So the R code will be on the wine data analysis so that you have some uh, practice, okay? Right, so any other uh, questions before we close? Yeah, okay, uh, after this, uh, I will put up the video, right? So in case you want to uh, watch it again for specific sections, um, you can do that at your own time, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll post up the video as well. Okay, so I think uh, that's all for tonight and uh, thanks for staying and listening, okay? So I'm going to end the uh, presentation now.